Welcome back to All About Avatar. You guys, I've been feeling so good. My second video, How the Legend of Korra Rune Spirits, did amazingly well. At the time of recording this, it nearly has 7,000 views, and that's just crazy to me. Some of you also joined the channel and subscribed, so welcome. And I'm really thankful for that. I also thoroughly enjoyed your comments and thoughts on Spirits and the Avatar franchise. It was awesome interacting with you guys, and I can see some kind of community building right here, which is really cool. Having covered my YouTube ecstasy, in this video we're going to be ranking all the Earthbenders and after the last Airbender and the Legend of Korra, using the oh so popular tier list system. Now you might be thinking, but wait, didn't the official after the last Airbender channel already make a video ranking the Earthbenders? Well, yes, you'd be right. But I don't necessarily agree with their rankings, so therefore I decided to take matters into my own hands and make my own tier list. Now, I'm going to be doing one of these for each of the four elements. So in the description you'll find a poll to vote for the next one. Do you want me to rank either the airbenders, the firebenders or the waterbenders of both series of Avatar? Let me know and we'll do that one the next episode. Regarding the system that I'll be using, I'll be evaluating each earthbender based on a combination of skill, power and advantageous abilities. Generally I rank them from the perspective of how good they are in combat using their earthbending. So, for example, Toph and Iwei both have the ability to tell whether people are lying using their earthbending. However, that does not really give them an edge in combat, so the ability does not contribute to their place on the tier list. Additionally, if people have abilities that imply that they are well versed in earthbending, like take for example metal bending, but we never see them actually use that type of bending, in this case metal bending, in combat, then that also does not really count towards their place. Concerning the tiers in the tier list, the first row is called Not Enough Rocks Throne. It just means that we haven't seen these characters earthbend enough for us to assess their skill level properly. Then we got Rockies, which, yes, is supposed to be a play on Rookies. I know, it's kind of hard-edged. Anyway, then we got Skilled, Prodigies, and Masters, and last but not least, the most legendary earthbenders in the legendary tier. Please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Your support it really helps me grow, and it is greatly appreciated. Alright then, from the legendary Tao Fei Fong to the up and coming Bo Lin, we'll be assessing each earthbender's strengths and weaknesses to determine where they belong on the tier lists. Get ready to see some earth shattering rankings as we count down to the best of the best in the world of earthbending. Let's get started. Let's go! <laughs> so, up in Not Enough Rocks Throne, the first one, the first earthbender on our list is the Truthseer from Zhao Fu, the only man to be able to tell lies, the one who's called Ai Wei. Now, Ai Wei, along with Toph, is one of the two characters, as I already mentioned, in the After franchise to be able to tell lies, except if you also count Azula. But, as I said in the intro, telling lies is not going to save you if there's a boulder heading towards your face. Apart from that, we know Ai Wei was highly skilled in particular techniques of earthbending, such as metal bending and seismic sense, but really the only time we saw him using that ability is when Team Avatar found out he was a lying son of a b**** and he erected a big metal wall. We've never seen him in combat, so he clearly belongs here. Alright, next up is another inhabitant of the Metal Clan, the It's Not A Face Mom abstract artist, One. Now, like Ai Wei, One is a metal bender, but we only really see him using this ability for his abstract metal art, and we never see him battling anyone, except for probably his own mind. And even if he did, he'd probably say something like, You're crushing my individuality! Therefore, he definitely belongs here in the Not Enough Rocks Throne tier. Up next is probably a bit more controversial. It's a book 2 villain and he's head of the Dai Li, Long Fang. Or should I call him Short Fang? Long Fang was a cool ass villain, but that's more attributed to his political game rather than his earthbending abilities and battle prowess. The one time we saw Long Fang earthbend is when he ended Jet. Now that was a clean fucking shot, but we can't derive his overall ability from just that one kill. While we can assume that being the head of the Dai Li comes with excellent earthbending abilities, we just haven't seen him in combat, so he definitely belongs here. Following Short Fang, we got One, the first avatar. Now, we can only derive that One is a master in earthbending, but we haven't seen him use that enough. Only when he's in the after state, or like this semi after state when he's connected to Rava, but that's definitely not enough. That's it for One, really. I don't really want to talk about him too much, because it makes me mad how they changed the lore in season 2 of Legend of Korra. So, moving on. Up next are the Sandbenders. The Sandbenders are pretty cool, you know? Their ability is special and it gives them a really big advantage in certain locations, such as... The Desert. However, 
their battle prowess is a knowable, as we never saw them battle using their sand bending. Think about it, it's actually kind of disappointing that we never really saw them battling against the gang. They just stole up, which, you know, I'll never forgive them for that. Okay, lastly, and this one's gonna be really controversial, and I hope you guys won't get mad at me, but it's Kyoshi. So, let me just put her somewhere here. Alright, so Kyoshi is probably the best earthbender of all time. However, we've never seen her in combat. Think about it. We've only seen her earthbend when using the avatar state, and she's kind of like just creating a wedge between two continents. Better rise of Kyoshi. Yeah, well, I haven't read that yet, okay? So, you have to wait until I read it. Okay, now that we got the Not Enough Rocks from people's earthbending guys out of the way, we'll be moving on to the Rockies. And the first group entering the Rockies tier are the Royal Guards. And oh my goodness, let me tell you, these dump heads are so freaking useless. We see their real battle prowess in the episode The Earth King in Season 2, where Team Avatar launches a full-on assault on the Royal Palace in Basingsei. And look, I know Team Avatar is really powerful and stuff, and they are all really great benders in their own right. But you can't tell me that a hundred of these guards that are tasked with defending the royal palace of the biggest city in the world are so freaking inept and all perish when confronted with four children. So they are probably less than rookies, but this is the lowest tier. Okay, concerning the next set of fools, they'd probably be friends with the royal guards in the sense that they are both really freaking shit. It's the Terra team. And an elite platoon of earthbenders. Passing say elite earthbenders. Sent out to defend against the Fire Nation drill in the episode The Drill. Only to be completely destroyed by just Ty Lee and Mei. The Terra team as a group is beyond useless. Now imagine just one of them. They probably got that Shyamalan live action movie earthbending vibe. <laughs> Alright, with those earthbending idiots out of the way, the first entry into the skilled bracket is none other than Katara's ex-boyfriend, Haru. <laughs> Haru is a prime example of being pretty skilled. He showed us just enough earthbending for that statement to ring true. I mean, he's displayed quite impressive strength, and it is clear he's capable of throwing some pretty big ass boulders around. Additionally, he's able to save a snitch ass elderly man from near death without crushing him in the process, which is respectable. We know that he was taught by his father Tyro, who was quite skilled, but not really a master or anything I'd say, so overall, very decent earthbender. So next up, it only makes sense to put Haru's father in this tier list, which is Tyro. When imprisoned in the episode, imprisoned, on a Fire Nation ship, Tyro showed zero fucking resilience, as he lost all hope, so he gets minus mental strength for that embarrassing display. It took a preachy Katara with a pen to inspire him. Well, actually, that didn't do it. It took Katara and rocks, actually. You know, it was probably just the rocks. And what do you know? Tyra is pretty good with the rocks. He was able to create a wall of coal to block off the Warden's fire blast. And I actually forgot to mention this with Haru. But both of them, Haru and Tyro, are able to use bending compression. Which, I don't know, might be useful. We've seen it in that episode. I don't really know how it works. I guess the rock might hit you harder, which... Okay, you get points for that. Overall, Tyra is a pretty cool earthbender. Moving on, we got the greatest showman in earthbending history. Fire Nation! The Boulder. He was the best fighter that participated in the Earth Rumble tournament. Except for that one other little blind girl. Really though, the Boulder's skill was mostly just muscle. He displayed great strength in combat and used simple earthbending to beat his opponents. He even succeeded in levitating the big fat hippo out of the arena, which is impressive. However, he doesn't really have any special earthbending abilities, so he belongs here in the skill bracket. Moving on, we've got some characters from The Legend of Korra. And here we have the Metalbender Police. Now, these guys are rather skilled. As their name suggests, they are excellent metalbenders, stopped by the greatest metalbender of all time, Toph Bei Fong. And with their metalbending armor, they have a lot of, you know, armor. And using their metalbender robes, they can display not only high mobility, but also high aerial mobility. And they've shown that they can use that to great advantage in, in combat. So, overall they'll bring a tough fight and you won't get rid of them that easily. The following Earthbender is a pretty unique one. One that is not really talked about much. Um, actually, it's the only Earthbender to fight with weapons, which is Gao. So, Gao showed great proficiency in his use of Earthbending using his two hammers. He was able to quickly throw several boulders around. And he's just as strong as Guy and was easily able to fend off Suko with his broadswords. 
Granted, it got fucking destroyed when Zuko said, you know, fuck it, I'm the crown prince. Still, he's very skilled and very capable, so he belongs here. Then we got two brothers, sons of Batar and Suyin Bei Fong. We got Wei and Wing. Unlike their emo brother, they spent their skill points less in depressive art and introspection and more in earth ending. Together, they are capable of launching large boulders, showing great strength and teamwork alike. Besides that, they are also very proficient in the art of metal bending. So much so that they even invented this game called Power Discs. They use their metal bending to their advantage, not only in games but also in combat, so generally they're very skilled. Actually, they are on the very high end of skilled, I'd say they're almost prodigies. But having said that, let's move on to the next tier. The first to enter the prodigies tier list is a dense motherfucker, none other than Sin Fu. Sin Fu showed excellent earthbending, both in skill and strength. He's able to unleash a myriad of earthbending attacks with incredible speed and power, only to be defeated by the bratty little mole girl. He's generally a really strong guy, able to fend off a lot of guys single-handedly, even without earthbending. Now, while he's definitely a prodigy, he does not seem to master neutral Jing, going more for a heavy offensive than to wait and listen, which withholds him from entering into the higher tiers. Okay, following Sin Fu, we got Sin Fu's partner in crime, probably even more dense than Sin Fu, Master Yu. Now, in contrast to Sin Fu, Master Yu opted for a more subtle approach, I'd say, to earthbending. He seemed to grasp the concept of neutral drink more than Sin Fu, showing great proficiency when sinking others into the ground. He's also a teacher at the academy. However, as a teacher, he does not appear to have mastery over New Jing. Now, strike as if you're punching through your opponent's head! Actually, he doesn't seem to grasp the concept at all. Too bad he's fucking crazy. Pretty okay, Earthbender, though. The next position is filled by a ruthless Earth Kingdom general, General Fong. General Fong is very well versed in earthbending, not only was he able to easily fend off Team Avatar, granted they were a lot weaker back then, but he also has the ability to bury people underground using earthbending. And that's kinda overpowered and horrifying. It kinda breaks the magic system of Avatar in general, but still, it's a powerful ability and it exists and he can do it. He's also a very strong earthbender, able to easily erect big stone walls, so, you know, pretty cool guy. A lot scarier than General Fong is the next entry in the tier list. Actually, it's not just one, there are a lot of them. And we get the scary-ass cultural police force, created by none other than Avatar Kyoshi, the Dai Li agents. Aside from being used as an instrument in totalitarian Basing Se to maintain control, they work some badass earthbending. Individually, they are all extremely skilled. They are really elite earthbenders, not like Terra Team. Capable of incredibly precise and strong earthbending. They are silent, precise earthbending assassins. They utilize earthbending gloves, launching deadly attacks with extreme precision. They ruin the daily agents in Korra as they come off really useless, so I'm just gonna go with their Atlas skill level and neglect their existence in Korra. Come at me. Next, we're gonna have another probably controversial pick. The last person to fill the Prodigy's bracket is none other than the last er- I wanted to say- <laughs> I wanted to say earthbender. <laughs> the last airbender himself, sorry, Aang. Due to him being an airbender, earthbending was more difficult for him as we saw in the series. Also, it conflicted with his avoiding nature, so it was just not really for him. However, Aang is definitely at the very top of this bracket. Not only did he show great power, able to launch immense rocks with great precision, Aang actually also learned seismic sense, which provided him with great strategic advantage in battle. Even though the creators confirmed that in the end Aang mastered all four elements, I feel like his earthbending and firebending needed a little more time in the oven to call it mastery. Hell, Top said so herself. Regardless, he did learn from one of the best and mastered neutral Jing and the philosophy of earthbending, so good job, Aang. Alright, so then we're moving on to the next one. Now the first master in this bracket is following the last airbender. Literally. We got the same spirit reincarnated into a bratty know-it-all teenager, Korra. Just kidding, I love Korra. And guess what? She's fucking strong. Unlike Aang, Earthbending was more aligned with her character and this she learned it rather well. I mean, you can't really fault Aang, he had to learn it before the end of summer and Korra was trained her entire youth by the White Lotus. Anyway, Korra's main advantage is her strength. Just like with all the other elements she uses, she kind of just uses a lot of raw as power, partly being the reason why she couldn't really learn airbending that well. Anyway, additionally, she also took up metal bending pretty fast and quickly showed great skill in using it, even using metal bender ropes with relative ease. Overall, Korra is just a really all-around amazing earthbender and she's definitely a master. The ensuing earthbender is the lovable pro-bending street rat comedic relief, Bolin. Being a part of the Fire Ferret's pro-bending team, Bolin became a highly skilled earthbender. 
However, with Pro Bending being his teacher, his style was more light on his feet rather than the typical grounded traditional earth bending. His Pro Bending is characterized by fast and precise shots. He displayed just how precise he can earth bend when he hit Plea's third eye with a pebble. On the other hand, Bolin can also show brute strength, lifting enormous boulders, summoning earth walls and even toppling an entire building. All the while, he himself is agile and hard to hit. While unable to learn metal bending, Balin acquired a far more powerful skill that grants him an amazing advantage, lava bending. And in my humble opinion, lava bending is way too OP, and it kind of ruins the magic system, Sumi. Still, it is canon that Bolin can heat streams of lava with ease at his opponents, possibly burning entire bodies alive in seconds. So there's that. Third in the line of avatars is the boomer who fucked up the next generation's possibility for a happy life. Wow, glad it's all fiction. Avatar Roku. There's not much to say about Avatar Roku. Roku was just clearly a master. He was well first in earthbending, able to create fissures in the ground, able to do earth skating, which provided him with great mobility. He could also disappear in an instant under the ground, both an amazing defensive and offensive ability, avoiding any incoming attacks and tunneling behind his enemy to hit him with a surprise attack. Additionally, it was a master of lava bending, easily the most overpowered earthbending ability in the whole Avatar franchise. He displayed amazing earthbending skills when fighting the volcano. A volcano is not an enemy, it's not even combat. Yes, it fucking is. It's my list. Okay, the next two of the master tier and also the last ones of the master tier are really subject to debate. We got Su Yin and Lin, her sister. The community has been split on who is the better bender, but I'd say it's highly likely to be Lin. First, let's talk about both generally, as they have a lot in common. Both are daughters of Toph Beifong, which, well, you know, gives you some credibility in earthbending. They are taught seismic sense and are both incredible earthbenders and even better metal benders, probably. They both have raw strength, precision, agility, and incredibly advantageous skills. They are both incredible earthbenders and are nearly equals. Okay, so the next one is Lin, so hear me out. I know Lin kind of got her butt kicked by Su Yin when they fought over their childhood issues. However, Lin was dealing with some Zuko choosing the good side kind of sickness, so she was facing herself, she was dealing with her trauma. I mean, after the fight she literally collapsed due to that, and additionally, I'd say Lin is likely far more skilled in combat, as she has years of combat experience as chief of the police force of Republic City. I don't know, I think that's enough to settle it, but you can really argue either way. What do you guys think? Let me know. Anyway, that will be the last for the master tier, so now we'll be moving on to the legendary ones, and we got several legendary earthbenders, and I'm really curious if you guys already know which ones are gonna be here, probably you do, but let's see. The first one is the legendary Gazan. Now, Gazan's whole stick was his legendary use of lava bending. As I already said, lava bending in itself is OP as fuck, but how Gazan used it was beyond overpowered. Gazan face changed earth into lava and back with incredible ease. He used that to his advantage in combat by creating lava shurikens as weapons. And he was also able to easily create gigantic pools of lava. And even topple down an entire airbending temple, liquefying the majority of his earth foundations into lava. Which, fuck you, Gazan. He even succeeded in destroying the famously indestructible wall of Ba Sing Se. Gazan was so skilled that he could even liquefy incoming earth projectiles and return them to the sender in their lava form. Like Bolin said, It's like I'm giving him ammo! To add insult to injury, Gazan was physically very capable, both being very strong and agile. From a combat perspective, Gazan is easily legendary tier. The next legendary earthbender is Furtreich enthusiast Kuvira. What makes Kuvira a legendary earthbending was her miraculous use of metal bending. Already from her first real introduction as the Book 4 villain in The Legend of Korra, she shows extreme accuracy, using metal strips to take down a large number of earthbending bandits effortlessly. The use of these metal strips allows her to blind her enemies and toss them around however she sees fit. When she's bending, it's like she's playing with how she can creatively and easily take down her opponents. Not only is she offensively a beast, but she's also incredibly well versed in dodging attacks from opponents. Even when facing worthy opponents like Su Yin or Korra, Kuvira's precision, agility and creative use of metal bending will always lead her to victory. Up next, the second to last legendary earthbender, we've got the kinda creepy but also likeable demented crazy earth king grandpa, Boomy. When it comes to raw strength, Boomy beats everyone. Just look at when he took back Bossing Say with an army consisting of himself. He was throwing around houses, probably full of people with ease. There really is no other earthbender with that kind of strength apart from Boomy. Additionally, while never confirmed as far as I know, 
Bumi can use seismic sense to his advantage, as seen in this clip. Also, can he metal bend? Why does no one ever talk about this? When bending Ozai's statue, it literally sounds like metal. Am I crazy or... I don't know. Anyway, we've never seen him use that in combat, so it doesn't really count towards his skill level. But concerning his bending style and philosophy, Bumi is based as fuck. He's a master of neutral jing, the art of waiting and listening before acting. And he's shown creative use of earthbending, as well as often bending the environment around him in unexpected ways. He's able to tunnel underground as well, which is an extremely useful skill in combat. Bumi is an overall perfect bender, he just has legendary mastery over his element. He has great skills, strength, philosophy and combat knowledge. Last but not least, we have our bready favorite mole girl. <coughs> okay, no, it's not June, it's Toph. Of course, who else could it be? Toph is the best, most overpowered earthbender in the entire franchise, hands down. Her mastery of neutral jing and her incredible seismic sense, developed in large part due to her blindness, gives her an extreme advantage in battle. Because she's able to see her opponents through vibrations in the ground, she's nearly impossible to catch off guard. And it allows her to anticipate her opponent's moves with uncanny accuracy and retaliate with deadly timing and precision. And then she even invented metal bending and used it as a beast in combat. You know, I'd probably even go as far as to say that Toph is probably one of the best benders ever to exist. If I'd have to fight anyone, the last person I'd like to see would be Toph. Except, you know, if I could fly, but I kind of can't. So yeah, there's that. All right, so that's the list. Thank you guys for watching. Do you agree with my ranking? Who do you think should be higher on the list? Who do you think should be lower on the list? Who did I get just right? I'm eager to know your thoughts. Also, don't forget to vote for the poll. Don't forget to like the video that really helps me out. And subscribe to the channel if you want to join the club. And have a good one. See ya. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you are very wise to choose.